Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Foreman Community Demo. For questions, uh, please reach out to us on the Foreman at IRC or on Twitter. I'll remind you on YouTube when you're watching the recording to up the video quality. Uh, the default is not great for our screen sharing. First of all, we have a new community manager. I mentioned this last demo started yesterday. Melanie, uh, Melanie, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, hello. Um, I think I've met a lot of people at the Foreman uh, birthday party last year, and um, uh, you might have seen my name around the, the community notice boards looking for um, comments on the open source version of the, the Red Hat uh, documentation, which is an ongoing um, effort. I'm yeah I'm looking forward to talking to people to getting to know the community better and um, to seeing how we can we can make things uh, a little bit better and brighter um, yeah and I think I'll I'll reach out to people and um, you'll be hearing from me soon. Thank you. We're really glad to have you join the team, um, and you'll see more and more from Melanie in the upcoming demos. Uh, but since she started uh, yesterday for today, that's it, and we'll move on. Uh, Red Hat Summit this year has turned into a virtual event, uh, like a lot of the conferences coming up. Uh, this is at the end of April, and since it became a virtual event, registration is actually free. So we have a community uh, section there. Um, where we have, will have devs not only of Foreman, but a bunch of Red Hat's projects um, of, in our upstream um, that will be there with live chats and demos. And uh, this is an opportunity since it's usually, it's in the US, either in Boston or San Francisco. Uh, not everyone could travel there uh, usually. So now that it is free and virtual, um, it will be have, uh, different demos and chats open across uh, uh, probably almost all time zones. So if you would like to join in, search for Red Hat Summit, you can see the registration there and uh, come see us and uh, the community section about Foreman. Foreman 2.0 uh, should be coming out really soon, possibly even this week, if not then early next week. Uh, thank you to everyone who tested our release candidates, reported bug, the, all of the fixes. Thank you to all of these. All of your hard work uh, made this possible, and we will see this out very soon. And now let's start our demo. So, Lukas, you are first um, demoing external IPAM uh, that was actually contributed by a community member. And after that, the DHCP cleanup break test. Lukash, to you. So yeah, today I'm um, one is really in one. I think uh, IPA my AM. <laughs> yep. So this is a new feature contributed by Chris Smith. And so I'll be I'll be showing. And essentially, what this is is heavily requested uh, IP interest management integration. So normally, I, may, I think this is the right time to explain a little bit how IP uh, AM. Every time I say IPMI, uh, that stands for Intelligent Platform Management Interface. I mean actually IP AM. Sorry about that. I just keep screwing these terms up. So. Uh, so in Foreman, uh, actually, when you create a new uh, subnet, it asks you to actually set um, address management, uh, and we have it here. And this is really this this already bring a lot of confusion. So let me explain a little bit. So we have a DHCP IPAMM, um, which is very often used, and this is actually not 
uh, address management in a sense of that uh, you as a former user can actually manage uh, IP addresses. You have a list somewhere of IP addresses allocated and stuff, and you can do a bunch of stuff. That's actually not what Foreman offers uh, or until today. Uh, this DHCP flag simply makes Foreman, every time it needs to create a new host, it asks our DHCP uh, proxy to actually pick uh, an, another free IP from, from, the, from the range. You can specify, specify the range here, start, start and end uh, IP addresses of the, of the range. But actually what it, uh, what it does is, you know, uh, the, the DHCP implementation randomly, or it's not random, it's actually sequentially picks the next variable uh, IP address that has not been allocated. So every DHCP module, either if this is a ISC DHCP or Windows uh, DHCP or, or Infobox, just keeps a list of, uh, you know, uh, records which are, you know, allocated and, you know, uh, it picks uh, uh, the next available IP address from the, from the, from the pool that is, that is not allocated. And then it returns and Foreman, um, Foreman actually uh, creates a new uh, record and then New host record and then the DHCP record is, uh, is allocated. In the meantime, it also the DHCP module, um, smart proxy module, actually reserves this uh, address for I think 30 minutes or, or five minutes. I'm not sure. So in case you are creating uh, several hosts in parallel in you know rapid succession, uh, it would not you know create create a you know um, race condition. So so it, it can actually sometimes skip an address. Uh, but uh, after like I think 20-30 um, minutes, it you know just freeze this cache and uh, the IP address can be reused. So this is really really simple, right? So you can't do much. We also offer two other um, options, which is internal DB and random DB, and this is actually something slightly different. This this is usually used when you don't have a DHCP or you don't want the DHCP to to and uh, pick those addresses, and you let Foreman to do essentially the same. Uh, pick uh, either internal DB picks another sequ uh, another free IP from uh, in a sequence, and random DB uh, uh, picks uh, an, the next IP address uh, randomly. But they, you know this is the only difference between those two guys. And uh, and it basically how this all only works in a way that Foreman tries to find. Uh, or have a list of all the hosts within this inventory of the provisioning interfaces, and it tries to find an IP address that is you know, not from this list, so either six sequence uh, or randomly. So this is really, we often get asked like, is this IP AMA um, address management? It is not actually, you can't really define any anything other than um, start and end of, of the IP range, but that's, that's all. We also have a none, which, Basically means every time you create a new host, you actually need to enter your IP address to the into the interface uh, user interface, or if you're using API or CLI, uh, so that's none. Now with the external IP AM, we have a new option here. If you select this, uh, the way it works is there is a new um, API. We have a smart proxy external IP AM API uh, that is essentially uh, very much like uh, give me uh, the next <laughs> variable uh, IP address, and also give me a list, a list of uh, you know subnets. Give me a list of groups. Most of the uh, address management uh, in software have a concept of groups or sections, where you basically divide your your, your, your where you essentially organize your your uh, uh, IP addresses and subnets. So optionally, if you want, you can map th map this one and enter a value here. Um, you, you don't need to if you don't need to use this. And then when you, uh, the, the second step, if you want to take, a, if you want to do external IPMA as is uh, uh, proxies, you need to select here, which of the smart proxies you want to do these calls for the external IPMI. Um, so these two th steps you need to do. Uh, I already have uh, uh, 
couple of subnets here. I have a external IPM, uh, IPM um, 6 and 4. It, it supports both uh, IPv6 and IPv4 already, so it, it is really cool. So in this tab, uh, hopefully, I mean, hopefully you can see this. Uh, this is actually um, so this 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 patch came with uh, the f initial implementation. So uh, we have this this part you see uh, like uh, these th new uh, new two flags you need to set are inform and core, and then there is a smart proxy API. Uh, and smart proxy plugin when the first initial implementation which was uh, done by chris is php ipam oh, jesus um which is a free and open source um and stuff you can in easily install this if you have a, i think it uh, works on my mysql and it only needs php it's really really fast easy to install although setting up an api access was a little bit difficult for me until i Chris helped me how to how to actually set it up. You just need to do some settings and, and register an application and stuff like that. However, other than that, it's it's pretty straightforward uh, IP uh, address management stuff. So you have a bunch of subnets. It already comes with some uh, exp um, uh, examples. So here's a here's a subnet 10, 10, uh, one, zero. and as you can see, you know you see a lot of you know graphs and and stuff, and you can allocate the uh, IP addresses and stuff. And it supports, of course, I think it supports IPv6 as well. Although we have a slight limitation, doesn't the API of the PHP IPAM doesn't reliably return IPv6 addresses at the moment. So it's a bug we need to, uh, I think, uh, file a, a report, but IPv4 works, works great. And the IP, uh, API is ready, so it should work. Uh, so. Here you can see I have one, two, three, four, five, six uh, addresses uh, already uh, located here. So this actually, this is because I created already two hosts prior to this demo, uh, Ida and Percy here. These are in the host group IP AM4. So what happens, so let me show you what happens when I, when I create an, another one. So I'll pick uh, next IP4. And I'll give it uh, some random, which one, this one shouldn't be, oh, maybe, let me just change it, 3A, right, so, um, yeah, maybe I should, I should show you, uh, so this created a new uh, host, and if I refresh this page, it is uh, 1.9, so, uh, sorry, uh, 1.9 to network interface 1.9 as you can see so essentially it was maybe too quick but uh, uh, the moment uh, when uh, foreman um, the moment uh, uh, when I was on the uh, networking tab here interfaces tab sorry here this is when you know it was so quick, so you couldn't see it. Um, but uh, you know this moment. This is the moment when when Foreman actually um, tries to uh, when Foreman asks the uh, smart proxy uh, plugin to give it another another IP address. Uh, it works as well with IPv6. However, there's limitation, and this is not our fault. This is actually this is actually I've researched this. This is coming from the from the PHP IP AM, it, it gives you a subnet address. This is not valid, uh, you know, IPv6 address. This is a subnet address. So it kind of doesn't work. So just, I need to edit it because this is not valid. Uh, but, you know, once this is fixed, it would re return a correct uh, IPv6 address. And, uh, and this is pretty much it. Uh, so the overall goal is now to, uh, because if you want to use this, what you need to do is, of course, you need uh, Foreman. I think I'm not sure this is not in 2.0, which is coming coming out soon. Uh, so probably 2.1 Foreman Core, and then you need uh, to have a uh, proxy plugin, which is called Smart Proxy IP AM from uh, Chris. Uh, this is Chris. Um, Chris uh, 
uh, GitHub repository, and this uh, implements the API. However, long term, we would like to uh, either merge the common code from here, so like the other or also other plugins could build on top of that. There's not much, but we could also we should take the similar approach as we have with DHCP. We have a concept of module and um, plugin, or it's like module and implementation, like DHCP is the module and DHCP IRC is the. Um, I, I think it's not called implementation within the smart proxy code base, but you you get the point. So this is this is for now. This is incubating. But it works great. So uh, just if you're interested, and we have, we had several requests already upstream and downstream about this particular PHP IP AM already, and also InfoBlocks is another uh, thing we should consider implementing because uh, at the moment, uh, if you do, um, if you install InfoBlocks, you can only select the uh, DHCP IP AM, which is really, uh, which is really. Um, uh, limiting. It's really it, it completely ignores what you set all your groups and stuff uh, within your info box. It just picks uh, another IP address that is not in use. It also the DHCP uh, module in Smart Proxy also tries to ping the address uh, using TCP ping and ICMP ping. And if that doesn't respond, it considers this, this IP address as free. So it's kind of a little bit hacky. But so so for this reason, I think external IPM uh, IP AM is the way to go. It's the, I think it has bright future. So great contribution, Chris. Uh, very well done. And I hope to see more providers being implemented. The API is well documented. It's within the code, so you need to go really and search for for this in in the form and code base. But uh, it, had a, it has a lot of comments. It's, it's well designed. So we, we made sure really that the API will will work. Thanks to everyone involved. Are there any questions? Let me quickly. No, I don't see. I'm not sure if I can see the chat, YouTube chat. I'm not uh, sure. No, there is no questions. Cool. Thank so you. the next one. The next topic uh, is quite small. Um, this is. You should see my terminal window. Uh, this is um, a rate task. Um, uh, this actually also has something to do with DHCP, and this is um, often when something fails during the creation of the DHCP record, or somebody you know deletes or updates the DHCP record on the DHCP server manually, or or often it, it can be also a bug that something doesn't work. And you can get into a situation where uh, the, the the hosts in the uh, in form and inventory uh, are not in sync with the situation of the DCP. So, like um, uh, for example, like if I'm using the ISC DHCP, that's the DHCP server in Linux, like the traditional one. Our reservations are stored in the varlib DHCP DHCP leases. That's the four DHCP D6 leases, like the D6. And as you can see here, this is the reservation. So this is like a pending, or like a file which is growing and growing. And from time to time, the uh, DHCP server squashes it into a small one. Um, and see what happens if I actually, uh, if I just, you know, because I have this, uh, maybe you didn't see, but I have this host. This is this one was created by a, uh, by a woman. What happens if I just you know delete this entry like manually here and I'm going to system I'll restart uh, DPD. So now you know I'm I'm out of sync. Like I have this carry ubic netlan host, but it's not on the um, the entry is not there. So the rake orchestration DHCP uh, to the rescue and it's uh, it's a uh, we have now two um, rate tasks. So the first one is called orchestration DHCP remove offending. And in both cases, it treats uh, the form and inventory as the single point of truth. And it tries to either remove offending is removing those um, those uh, records from the DHCP server, which are not in the form and inventory. This is dangerous. Like 
uh, it can actually remove something that you don't want to do. So by default, both of these rake tasks are like um, dry run. So it, it will only print you what it would do if you provide a special parameter, which is called, uh, I think I forgot, but I think it's uh, perform. So like, uh, it's not showing uh, anything right now because th there's nothing extra. The, the second one is, I think if I remember, I remember clear, I need to, I, I forgot what's the name of the, the other one. Um, no, let me just add missing. So it's, it's add missing. Add missing. I need to provide a subnet name and then, so this should tell me like the, the host name. So let me just quickly go and switch and you know, on my, on my, until this uh, carry ubic, it should tell me that, that carry ubic is, is not present and it would, yeah. Needs to, needs to config rebuild. So now if I do perform equals one, I think, I don't remember. It's some time ago. Um, I think it should perform the, I think it will blow up of course, because it's demo, right? But uh, it should create a DHCP record over our, uh, so it uses our our uh, DNS uh, interface, like API, Smartbox API. So it's just, what would Foreman do actually when, when when uh, creating this part. So it looks like it works. Um, so cool. So if I just fail the HCP release, it's, it's there. So it, it, it fixed it, fixed the problem. So uh, remember, this is these are dangerous uh, commands. So it can actually add a lot of stuff that you don't maybe don't want, or it can remove a lot of stuff from your DHCP server you don't want. So before running these, it's uh, just please go ahead and, and um, back up your DHCP data. In this case, it's DHCP releases. DHCP D6 laces, but if you're using Infobox, it should work with any kind of DHCP server. Doesn't matter. It just, again, it calls the API that Foreman does. So uh, just make sure you have uh, backups and you're good to go to clean up your DHCP reservations. That's all from me today. Thank you, Lukash. We're now moving to Chris Roberts talking about update tracer UI areas. Hey, all right, so let me go ahead and share my screen here. All right, so um, hopefully everybody can see that. I'll zoom in on it a little bit. Uh, yeah, so one, things, right, cool. uh, so one of the things that uh, launched, I think, a while ago was Tracer to be able to, so when you update a host, you'd be able to see um, which services needed to be restarted, and then you can either restart those with the fellow agent uh, code execution. Um, and obviously, with the Hello Agent going away, that's code execution is going to be the default. Um, so there really wasn't much as far as to what what it does, how to how to install it, and so forth. So I just wanted to show a few things that I've added to the UI, and then um, talk about some things that are going to come that I'm working on presently. Uh, so one of the first things here is if we go to register a content host, we can actually see now it's a much better description. Before it was basically just saying hey to optionally report tracer information. So now we can actually see what this is. Um, so hopefully we can get some more people to use it because it's a really awesome feature, especially if you can't reboot a host, such as like a critical production server, but you want to restart some of the services. Um, so that's one of the first options. So the first thing is, is if I go to this no tracer one, um, and I apologize for taking slow, this is a development box. We can actually see now that tracer is, actually has a spot next to Catello agent. Um, and we can see here that it's not installed on this guy. Um, and if I go to traces here, we can see here that we've got a notification box now saying how to, to use it. Here's what it is and or how to install in the package name. And then we've actually got the same information that we put in the registration to kind of say, if somebody's just clicking on this for the first time, to kind of give some more information on what this tab is for. Um, so now I'll go ahead and show you a host that does have tracer on it. Um, so we see we have the same kind of um, UI as far as Catello Agent. Um, so if you notice the one thing, when Catello Agent is not installed, we do show a warning sign. We're not doing that with Tracer because um, some people don't want to use it, and we shouldn't throw warnings if we don't need to. Um, so the next thing I want to show you is the traces here. If you notice, the UI pop-up is different now. Um, we don't, um, are not showing that because obviously it's installed. 
and we do see that the um, more information about what it is um, is there still and it works still the same way um, we can still click on these guys and restart them i don't have remote execution on this um, so i can't redo them but that's kind of what i wanted to show the next thing that we're adding right now that i'm working on is currently to do traces you have to go to each host and manually go to the traces tab and restart it um, i'm working on a way right now where we can just do a bulk action just like we do with a lot of different things like this um, so you can be able to see which hosts which hosts are affected which services and then go ahead and issue um, a remote execution job that's kind of all i had stop sharing great thank you chris our last presenter for today uh, is Mark and Mark was actually nice enough to redo two of his demos from last time which unfortunately because of some technical issues uh, we couldn't see the screen changing uh, so Mark will be redoing uh, the request to UID and audits and subnet order and then has two new demos for today uh, the dashboard and DB cleanup after a plugin removal and rail seven server versus uh, workstation fact. Mark T. All right, uh, so I'll share my screen. Hopefully it's gonna work. I actually will have to share from two different computers today. So hopefully it will work better than last time. So uh, hopefully now you can see my audits page in my format. Yes, we can. Perfect. Um, so this is, uh, this is basically a redemoing of what I was trying to uh, show last time. Uh, as you all probably know, um, we track uh, changes for our database objects. We call it audits. Every such change is one audit record. Uh, and then we also provide a quite nice UI to show those changes. So for example, if you want to see what happened uh, during the last change to this host, in Bragg's example, TST, can unfold and see the changes in here. So build mode change from false to true, uh, and the timestamp was also updated. Now, this is nothing new. This is what we have before. Uh, but what we now added is uh, tracking uh, or grouping the audits uh, by request. Every foreman or every HTTP request uh, can uh, can um, create multiple audit records in our database. And uh, we actually stored that information in our database for a while, uh, but now we enabled easy searching or filtering by, by given request. So the use case here is, for example, uh, you realize that uh, you have a new operating system created in your, uh, in your Foreman instance, let's say this Fedora 29, and you would like to know what happened during the request uh, when it was created. So you can, from this record, you can say uh, administrator user updated it. Uh, but if you want to see what else happened during that request, here we added this request UID um, uh, link to the detail. And that represents the request. If you click on that, uh, you would get filtered, you would get only the audits filtered for that event. Uh, this one uh, actually only has one audit record. I thought I had, uh, had more audit entries in here. Yeah. So when I click on the creation of the operating system, not the update, I see also two more audit records uh, from that request. So as you can see, a new interface of this host was created. And also I can see what, uh, what actually was updated on such a network interface. So I can tell that this pretty probably happened as the outcome of the facts importing uh, for this host. So as I mentioned, we already had that information in our database. So that should work even for people who upgraded from older versions. From now on, you will see this uh, request UID link. There's a tiny button in, in uh, what you've just seen. When I click on this link, it should also update the search bar in here. Uh, so you could update uh, the search syntax later. Um, I think it's already fixed in, in develop branch, uh, but on this instance. So that was the first thing. Uh, I'll 
move to a different computer. I'll share, share screen from there, so give me a sec. All right. Um, so I think the next thing I wanted to show was, or last time I was trying to show was ordering of the of the subnets. Uh, I don't have uh, I don't have that much to show in here. I can just uh, maybe explain what that was. So here I have multiple subnets, and as you can see it's possible to sort by network address. Previously, we always uh, sorted alphabetically, and that can cause problems. For example, if you have a number 10 and number 200, while one is alphabetical or two, now we actually uh, take into consideration um, uh, the number instead of alphabetical order. So you can sort subnets that correctly. That was a small thing. And to the new stuff. Uh, so again, that's something a bit hard to demo, but you may have seen uh, that if you installed a plugin and then decided you don't want to use that anymore, uh, that can cause problems because we keep some data in our database. And there are two small enhancements to this uh, that were emerged recently. The so one is uh, on the dashboard, the problem was if you used uh, widget uh, from a plugin that you removed, uh, the widget would still remain on the dashboard, but it would fail to render. So you would see a red error message in here in this box, in a box created from plugin. So that's reports breakdown. Now with this patch, uh, you will not see those widgets anymore. We still keep them in database. So because we can't tell whether a user just or an administrator just wanted to hide the plugin for a moment and they will reintroduce it after upgrade or something. So we didn't want to delete that. We didn't want to delete user preferences if they reorder the widgets on their dashboard. Uh, but we just ignore the error. We just hide them. So that's one thing. Uh, the second thing is related to, uh, to other pages and other data that you might have in your, um, in your format after a plugin removal. So I'll try to demonstrate it on settings, which is a uh, place where you would encounter that issue. So now what happened is um, I had a uh, I had a plugin Cotillo installed, and let's say I disabled that, and this page would normally try to display all the information about such settings that I had for Cotillo, uh, but it can't because uh, class definitions are already. So instead of uh, showing you 500 error and Saying, well, you can go to console and or fix your database manually. Uh, we slightly enhance this page, so we tell you there is a settings table in, in SQL database, and uh, we can't load data from that because of the column category that contains uh, unknown classes in content. Um, and we also advise you to do the backup first, obviously. Uh, of your database, but uh, it should now be possible to delete the data. If you click on this button, you confirm you really want to delete that, we'll try to clean up the database for you, this specific table. And then, voila, uh, the page works again. Uh, now, obviously, uh, this works nicely on the settings because usually there are no foreign keys or other objects don't actually relate to this table. Um, but on other pages, that may be a problem. Um, so if uh, for some reason, we can't delete that because there are other objects linking or referencing objects we are trying to delete. We would inform you this is impossible. You still need to manually clean up your. All right. And last thing I wanted to show today was uh, regarding um, uh, how we distinguish between uh, RHEL 7 server and RHEL 7 workstation. The problem used to be that. Whenever we received facts from Puppet, um, as you know, we parse them and we create objects in our database and assign host to operating system that we've seen reported in facts. Uh, and we create also a um, few more objects. But in this case, uh, we didn't really distinguish between uh, rel server and rel workstations. Um, they are basically different operating system versions. You usually want to have different provisioning templates assigned to these operating systems. 
But once you deploy Puppet on them, they would all be unified under Red Hat operating system. So you wouldn't be able to distinguish, or if you want to rebuild the host, um, they would get the same provisioning templates. Uh, so that, that was the problem. Now, what we started, started to do is we started to look at an, another fact that tells us what uh, what release of RHEL 7 this is. So here, as you can see, um, we keep Red Hat as the operating system name for RHEL 7 server, but there's a new operating system name recognized by Foreman Red Hat Workstation, um, as the name suggests, for RHEL 7 Workstation. And just to show you how or what is the fact that we look at for that, we look at facts for this host. There's a uh, uh, fact called this ID. So if we search that fact, this is the this is the value that we actually uh, look for when we decide what operating system to assign. Um, obviously, th this has been now changed for the Puppet factor. Um, there are also open pull requests for um, for subscription manager effects in Catello and uh, for form and Ansible as well, uh, because these are typically the effect sources that people may combine on a single host. Uh, other plugins should also ideally update that. So uh, Salt and Chef should be ideally updated, but it's not a big deal if, if they are not updated at the same time, because uh, most likely users will not have Chef Client and Puppet Agent installed on. So they wouldn't uh, flip the value. And yeah, that's that's really all. Thanks, Marek. And thank you for joining again. That is all that we had for today. Thank you to all of our presenters. Thank you for watching and see you next time.